Greetings all. Welcome to the Open Research Institute Remote Labs Equipment Review. Open Research Institute is a nonprofit research and development organization which provides all of its work to the general public under the principles of open source and open access to research. Remote labs are two physical lab benches. They have equipment for advanced digital communication design work. This equipment will be accessible online to anyone, anywhere that wants to work on open source amateur radio satellite service or open source amateur radio terrestrial engineering development. The primary focus of the equipment list reviewed today is to support the design, verification, and test of the DBB family of links. DBBS2, S2X, and T2 are all commonly found in amateur radio. DVBS2X is the protocol family used by the Phase 4 ground and space downlink. Remote Labs is a part of an extremely important process of reestablishing free and open international collaboration with groups such as AMSAT DL, JAMSAT, and AMSAT UK, and to increase and amplify collaboration with Libraspace and other open source groups, and also to all individual amateur radio operators and enthusiasts that want to take advantage of an open source lab bench. This is possible for ORI to do by using the open source carve outs in the US export control regulatory framework. These controls have impeded international cooperation on amateur satellite work for a long time. A significant amount of regulatory relief was achieved over the summer by ORI for amateur radio satellite work and more work is going on right now to build upon that. Please see our website for more details on this. Today's discussion is not specifically about satellite technology, but about the equipment and resources required to advance the state of the art. We are fortunate to have the advice and input of people that, have make, a, that make a living by using remote labs at work. The advice received so far has been heard and acted upon. Python, HTML5, plus JavaScript, and command line access will be the initial methods used to provide secure access to the equipment. We will not be writing or using a heavy or complex software framework for the remote lab. We will be authorizing and authenticating users. It's highly likely that we'll use the same authentication and authorization approach that we intend to use for the payload communication access in order to get more experience with that design. In other words, you may be authenticated and authorized for remote labs the same way that you'll be authenticated and authorized for the payload communication system. We will definitely be documenting how to use the labs we will be responsive to feedback about accessibility and ease of use. There will be someone physically present at the remote labs. The equipment is not installed in racks at an unattended site. If a function needs on-site setup or a test plan can only be done with someone physically at the bench, well, then that's how the work will be done for that particular function. Remote labs is offered as a community resource. Therefore, the review process needs to include community feedback. Thank you for your time here today to discuss and review the equipment list. As an example of what we're after, Thomas Perry has provided the following feedback uh, already. One, the initial list had no power supply listed. Two, a computer controlled coax switch matrix would be very useful to control where the signals are going between test gear, device under test, et cetera, without physical intervention. Three, some form of general purpose digital low frequency IO device like an analog discovery would be useful for controlling things remotely. Or a way to get arbitrary RF in and out of the PC, for example, an SDR on the bench would be very useful. And five, please remember cabling. And Wally Ritchie responded with an updated list that includes coax relays controlled from a USB relay board and many of the other items. So our practice will be to validate and measure any cables we make in-house, any we buy, or any that we obtain as a surplus or a donation. I can answer your questions about budget operation and policy at the end, uh, either today or by email. And please welcome Wally Ritchie, who will lead today's Remote Labs Equipment Review. So back to you, Wally. Okay, thanks, uh, Michelle. Um, Okay, so we're going to uh, we're going to focus on on the big ticket items, um, as well as as uh, re briefly reviewing what we're what we're doing here and and the things that, the items that we need to test. Um, so just uh, to review the project, uh, basically the the project's goals are two parts. First is a, a, a transponder suitable for geo or near geo, 
And that we call that the P4X DMT uh, portion of the project. And it's all digital design uh, all the way to uh, the final IF. It's uh, intended to be fully verified and validated um, and ready for a final adaption to a specific uh, space or ground missions. Um, the second piece of the project is a low cost modem. And by low cost, we're talking an entire uh, off the shelf um, earth station, including the antenna for well under $500. Um, the modem piece of that is the key key piece, which is the core of the terminal. Um, and it'll have a, a full high performance DBBS2 receiver. And it'll be completely standalone. It won't require any additional PC or any additional support. And mostly the philosophy there is to eliminate software and configurations and drivers and all that uh, stuff that's traditionally a problem. Uh, basically, the modem will operate with LB and uh, uh, IF inputs and outputs. And the modem piece will be um, targeted at less than $250. And uh, please feel free to interrupt uh, with any, any questions as I, as I go through this. Basically, we've got three phases for the project that are organized along the traditional uh, um, U.S. military type uh, um, NASA uh, phasing. Uh, phase one is basically a feasibility demonstration prototype. And the intent there is to demonstrate the functional hardware and um, register transfer language and, and software uh, for, and we selected for feasibility, the uh, fully functional DVBS2 transmitter chain. Um, the reason for that is, um, uh, we have a lot of work already in that piece, so it's, 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 it's the easiest piece for us to verify, and it's also very useful for some near-term missions that are, that are looking for DVBS2 transmit, uh, not related to our uh, repeater functionality. Um, phase one will also get all of our remote development tool chains uh, in operation and the test bunch that we're talking about, as well as our verification and validation framework. Um, and during phase one, we'll finalize uh, the specs. Uh, so we have a complete definition of the phase two. Um, and phase, phase one uh, is already completely funded. Phase two, uh, objective are to produce fully functional prototypes. These aren't space articles. They're not intended to be ready for space, but they're, they're intended to be fully functional and ready for the final steps needed to uh, to get them ready for space. Um, and in, in the DMT, the digital multiplex transponder portion, that will include all of our multi-channel receivers, uh, both our wideband and narrowband multiplexers, all of our authentication, uh, authorization and allocation protocols, um, our, our full DVBS2 um, variable coding and modulation, and uh, over over the air reconfiguration. Uh, we also want to have at phase two a package that would be suitable for uh, deploying as a ground based repeater for testing on uh, QO100. Um, uh, there's a paper on that, that that's a couple years old uh, that explains that uh, particular application. That would have twice the delays that we'd see in the satellite environment, but would uh, otherwise allow us to test the. Uh, almost all the functionality of the DMT. And then finally, phase three, uh, phase two is also fully funded thanks to uh, the generous grant from uh, uh, ARDC. Uh, phase three would be our final actual space deployments. And those could be ARIS or Gateway or 6UGEO that, that we've been talking about um, um, and is starting to crystallize. Um, and it could also be partner projects that, that fall out of our development efforts over the next uh, couple of years. Any, any questions on this part so far? Okay, so basically we're, um, we're intending to build these pieces pretty much along the lines of standard CubeSat bits. 
um, mostly electronic boards, standard form factor. Um, our, our principal target is a 6U, although it could be 12U. It's because of the power that we're talking about, we're talking about um, a, a 50 watt uh, class, at least satellite, uh, more likely a uh, 100 watt class satellite. Uh, so the size is uh, six six U. We believe is probably the smallest size that this would be uh, suitable for. Um, this is this is roughly the size of the transponder DMP package, uh, depending on on what configuration of redundancy uh, is installed in it. Um, it's, it'll be likely to be five boards. Uh, the architecture. Um, is uh, basically we have wideband receivers, and this is all digital. So there's no there's no analog bent pipe here at all. The, the uplinks and downlinks are completely independent. Um, no relationship. Uh, it's only bits that we pass from one side to the other. Um, so on the left side is our inputs, which are wideband. Wideband meaning. Our, our difference between wideband and narrowband uh, is is uh, classic uh, definitions. Narrowband is 25 kilohertz or less channels, and wideband is is uh, great, typically 100k and up. But uh, then there's the no man's land in between. Uh, we'll probably also have an aux aux receiver for uh, command and control. Uh, basically. All of these receivers feed various formatters. One of those is a GSE formatter, um, where there's a, a, an independent GSE stream per channel. Uh, the second, which is a, another way of handling wideband, is uh, uh, to multiplex it as IP over a single GSE uh, stream that handles IP. And then on the narrow band side, the narrow band is, is basically isochronous real-time voice. And, that capability would utilize the narrowband channels and be able to provide n times 800 bit per second channels at uh, 25 frames per second is what our, our provisional uh, uh, frame rate is. All of these things basically go into the DBB transmitter. They're just pure BB frames. So the priority is given to the narrowband multiplexer because of its real time isochronous requirement. And then everything else, the complete ready to, to relay BB frames are uh, pulled off the transmitter and sent down the downline. Then in charge of uh, managing this whole process is a controller entity. Um, they'll be running on uh, uh, dual cores or, or quad cores of the uh, uh, FPGA SOC device. And uh, those will also have an auxiliary transmitter that we would use for command and control. The interfaces uh, uh, to the rest of the system, the host system, can be CAN or RS-422, L LVDS, or CERTES. We, we, we would frown upon using I2C or other uh, SPI or other single-ended single, single -ended interfaces um, for a robust design, uh, so we'd prefer to use differential interfaces for everything, uh, although there, there might be SPI in uh, and I2C in some cases on board. Um, in terms of physical architecture, the, the partitioning that we see uh, at the moment would be, uh, and this is a redundant configuration, one-to-one one -one redundancy. So there'd be a primary digital radio and a secondary digital radio. So basically those would be completely duplicated. And then on the bottom side, we'd have uh, a primary and secondary baseband processors. The blue lines uh, between all these things are JSD 204B CERTES interfaces. So basically, uh, by using these high-speed serial interfaces, we don't have the problem that um, earlier designs have with uh, very large numbers of A to D parallel bits for A to D converters. We're using serial um, converters for everything and serial radios. Um, that allows us to have a much more flexible um, um, uh, reconfiguration capability, as well as a uh, uh, greatly in, increased uh, reliability. Um, with the parallel interfaces, if you destroy one bit, you, you've 
lost the whole interface. Um, and then basically um, uh, for the satellite bus, whatever it's residing in, uh, we'd have both CAN bus and, and uh, RS-422 uh, buses available. That could be um, space bus or, or, or any ad hoc uh, or standard protocol that someone may want to use. So the major functional blocks, uh, I think we'll just skip past this, but basically the, um, um, the formatters basically format the frames that are received from the wideband uh, receivers. Uh, the narrowband frames uh, get priority and the wideband frames are basically are, are a, um, a stream per channel on the GSE side. Um, alternately, the widebands can pass IP packets and those IP packets can be encapsulated under using GSE protocol uh, into BB frames. Uh, the narrow band multiplexer um, handles uh, the, the large numbers of channels and, and we're talking about support for hundreds, perhaps even a thousand channels. And uh, the, this multiplexer combines all the low, low bit rate channels. Uh, it operates isochronously 25 frames a second. Uh, the channels can be flexible depending on the capabilities of the station uh, and, and times 800, ranging from uh, 800 uh, bit per second channel suitable for text to 12,000 uh, bits per second for a high grade code uh, codec. Uh, the typical uh, minimum voice would be a 2400 uh, bit per second channel. Uh, which is sufficient to do wideband uh, codec, uh, wideband uh, exceeding toll quality on um, using current technologies. Um, these channels, the, um, the telemetry streams as well as store and forward traffic and other traffic will be packed by the multiplexer into the silence periods in voice. Uh, so the protocols would be designed so, so when when there's a pause in the speech, this occurs pretty pretty often, actually 30 to 40 percent of the time. We'll be stuffing data in those channels and that can be pulled off um, in the modems and made available. And that's the telemetry, uh, logs, uh, FTP, stored and forward, whatever. Um, and in, in the narrowband multiplexer would run the channel allocation protocols uh, to handle the authentication, authorization, and and uh, allocation. The core of the system would be uh, Zinc UltraScale, which is a, a UltraScale Plus. Uh, this is a 16 nanometer technology. And basically, um, this is optimized uh, compared to the previous generations. There's a lot more features, a lot more uh, redundancy and reliability. There are several units that are actually triple processor type uh, voting logic units, the platform management unit in the middle, um, the configuration and security unit. So th those units are built, and even though the technology here is 16 nanometer, that doesn't mean that everything is, is, is uh, using the smallest features. So there's, there's actually increased radiation uh, tolerance to this design. Uh, because it's specifically designed to be able to support avionics and space. So basically on the processing system side of the Zinc, um, there's uh, application processing units, which are basically Cortex-853s. There'd be either two or four, depending on which, um, um, which uh, particular chip that we select in the, in the final design. Um, they also um, support floating point uh, instructions and uh, the NEON instruction sets for SIMD. The RTUs and the block below that are basically uh, ARM R5 processors. And these, these are all, this is a dual processor that can run lockstep. So, so this, this is a um, high reliability design. Um, where if, if there's any um, any hit to any um, any of the two processors and they produce a different result, there's a reset to, to restart the system. 
And this is used in uh, not just avionics in space, but also in safety and automotive applications. And then the core where we do all the RF stuff is programmable logic. And, and um, this, this, um, this technology, so the 16 nanometer is capable of uh, transceivers up to 26 uh, gigabits per second. Um, although we won't be running anywhere near that rate. And it has the usual assortment of USB 3 and PCIe Gen 4, 1000 uh, gig um, uh, Ethernet. Those things we would not be using, but they would be available for us to tap during uh, um, test, test operations as part of our test uh, harnessing. And the high speed on, on this particular family uh, includes uh, in, inter, interlock in GTH transceivers up to 16 gigabits and GTA, uh, GTYs up to 32 gigabits. There's a, a pretty wide family. Um, the ones that we're looking at and focusing on initially is a uh, process is a, is a ZU6 uh, family, um, and that has roughly half a million um, uh, gates, tons of flip of of, of um, FPGAs and uh, 24 transceivers. I'll just skip. Uh, past all of this. Uh, one of the things, even though this is a newer technology and can end up consuming more power, um, although it does much more with more power, it's also able to do more with less power uh, because of the way the uh, power domains are managed. So um, when very low power states are required, uh, the necessary resources can be started and uh, other sections that are consumed power, for example, the entire FPGA core can be uh, shut down and, and, and consuming zero power. And basically, so on the radio side, we're looking at uh, uh, the, the primary candidates are 9371. Um, this is used on one of the high-end Edis boards uh, now, and it's the second generation um, uh, radio chip. The main advantage being it doesn't have all the parallel interfaces. Instead, it's the uh, transmitter receives streams from the two receivers and two transmitters and observation receivers. All of that data is passed on the serial interfaces. And there's an, another version that's a, a more modern version, um, um, later generation or half a generation beyond the 9371 that we'll also be looking at. And that basically has a, the functionality similar to uh, two of the 9371s, although they're a little bit different. Uh, So for to now we, we can move on, uh, move on to uh, what we're going to have on the test bench capabilities. So the 9371 uh, with, with these with this level of um, chip, we move beyond uh, data sheets uh, describing them. Um, in many cases, features are described by software modules. Um, there's just that much stuff. Even the radio chip itself has an ARM core on it and has certain functions that it performs automatically for calibration and other things. So you need a reference platform that you know works. You, you can't just start with a chip uh, and a breadboard. So uh, the reference platform for the 9371, um, uh, the initial and the, the, the standard platform uh, consists of the, the 9371 reference board and a 706 um, module that's pictured here. So the, the, there's a uh, previous generation sync actually on this, um, this module, the, the ZC706. That's the processor that's used in the Rincon um, SDR. Um, so it's an earlier generation, um, 
and uh, the radio is uh, the drivers will work on um, on both the the um, earlier generation Zinx seven thousands and the newer ultra scales, but some of the early reference uh, reference uh, designs are are based on the ZC seven hundred six. Um, so that's and this is the ninety three seventy one. So these two boards um, make up the reference platform. So that's your starting. If you ever have to talk to analog devices about some issue on the chip or some issue with the driver, et cetera, um, it's going, you, you generally will have to go back to a reference platform so they can reproduce uh, the same thing that you are seeing. Now for our actual um, device, uh, before we get to the stage of, of our actual 12 layer, 16 layer boards, whatever, whatever we need, we're planning to use off-the-shelf commercial model uh, modules that Trends, uh, a German company, manuf uh, manufactures. So they come in different varieties in the form factors, such that we can fit it on a CubeSat uh, size board. And they basically integrate uh, a 900-pin uh, uh, FPGA um, SOC, MP SOC module and uh, memory. These typically are only normal uh, DDR, not error correcting. We'll be using error correcting in the final design, but uh, uh, that'll generally be transparent to the most of the early software. So this is a this is the module, 76 millimeters by 52 millimeters, uh, and basically the module is designed to plug into a carrier board, and these are our high pin count uh, parallel uh, interfaces that are that are used to bring out the, the pins. We don't need anywhere near uh, this number of pins, but this is what's available on these modules. And they're designed to plug into a carrier for, for initial testing. And that includes the assortment of all the usual cast of characters for IO, um, USB 3, uh, 10 gig ethernet, um, um, uh, various high-speed transceiver, uh, USB-C, uh, connectors, etc. So this this is the platform that that can be used for initial development. So we can we can be carried through the first six months or so of the project with this platform as we uh, determine exactly what we want to have on it, hard hardware wise, and um, lay out the the uh, the actual uh, baseband board. It's just another view. And we can we can mount these in a rack um, with two of them if necessary. So um, they can be powered and and basically this this will be what what will be on the bench that we'll be remotely accessing uh, to run the um, these will be connected through Vivado and, and other tools to be uh, be able to uh, test with. On the DBB side, we we uh, although we we have some reference platforms now, um, it, they don't go up to extend to DBBS to X, which we want to be able to cover. So, in each of our test benches, we'll have um, the, an off-the-shelf uh, uh, DBBS to X modulator that that we're able to use. So this this will serve as our standard reference. DBBS 2X, and that'll eventually be replaced by our um, our DBBS 2 signal. The alternative is we could buy fifty thousand dollar you know test benches, Rodeo and Schwartz things, uh, but um, this solution is a, a bit more economical, and it's also structured. If you notice the block diagram, basically. This modulator, we push BB frames to the modulator and they come down the uh, DBB2 um, L band, um, which is the same thing that we're doing in the baseband uh, and radio modules. So it's BB frames in, RF out. And this we can, in our early test setups, we could be sending BB. Uh, frames to this device 
and processing the DVB carriers right away as we develop what, what uh, actually goes into the uh, BB frames. And the opposite side of this on the receiver, DVB uh, S2X receiver, uh, same thing. It produces, uh, it takes the RF in just like a satellite receiver would or the modem would, and it outputs BB frames. In terms of the general equipment, uh, general purpose test equipment, uh, we selected um, we we've selected initially Regal devices. Regal's a Chinese um, company that makes some very nice but economical equipment. Very uh, well done. They also OEM. They make some of Agilent's uh, low end gear uh, for them as an OEM uh, supplier. So. Um, Price performance wise, they're they're very hard to beat, especially in the frequency range that we're running. Um, so their signal generator is this um, um, 821, and it, uh, it it'll run up to 2.1 gigahertz. And uh, the phase noise on this is very good um, for spectrum analysis. Um, the um, this is their, their top of the line model, which is combines a spectrum analyzer um, with a vector network analysis. So this this is both a spectrum analyzer and a vector na uh, network analyzer that runs up to 6.5 gigahertz. And we'll put all the manuals and data sheets out uh, on, on this various uh, equipment. So this, this unit, um, it basically it, it's it's a Linux based system and it has a, a large display and it's able to do a, a, a more than the traditional um, spectrum analyzer in terms of, of analysis. Um, the the lower right hand corner um, diagram is showing a, a actual extra dimension of time integration of the of the signals as well as their amplitudes and and time. So very capable piece of equipment and it's all accessible remotely. So we can set up a con test configuration and then the equipment can be uh, manipulated remotely to uh, uh, display or capture whatever's needed. And those images can be um, uh, transferred remotely. Um, for standard um, mixed signal um, support, there's an, another um, unit in the family that's a, a four channel digital scope that's also a 16 channel digital analyzer uh, integrated with it. So this allows um, mixed signal where, where digital signals can be triggering events and analog up to four channels of analog can be captured uh, to, to um, uh, grab the analog that was associated with those digital signals. Um, so this is useful for things like uh, I2C. The picture on the upper left um, is an actual I2C um, signal, analog signal that's been grabbed and and uh, decoded into the actual data. And on the right hand side is a mixed uh, mixed signal display with multiple, um, and you can trigger off of those events and, and display the analog or digital waveforms from the uh, four primary channels. Now, a lot of these features, some of the features in the digital domain, they're, they're available in Vivado in the tools. If you instrument uh, the tools correctly, you can grab these uh, types of displays like the one on the upper right-hand corner. Um, but you, you typically don't have access to the types of analog information that can be triggered with these. Okay, so th those are the major pieces of equipment. There's a couple of other items um, like the uh, frequency counter and power meter um, and the um, various equipment that um, that can be used to um, that it can be used to control the, the actual configurations. So any questions? I was thinking when you were saying about the the CAN or RS-422 being the main interface to the, the host platform, whether it would be useful to have a, an adapter, basically USB, into to CAN or RS-422? Um, 
yeah, yeah, we probably should should have those uh, gadgets. There's there's a lot a lot of little items that we can add to the that we should add to the list. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, FTDI cables and uh, FTDI parallel cables and, and things like that. I was curious the the RSA is that also a VNA or I was trying to look up the information online because I think originally it said VNA in the list. The uh, the end model is both a VNA and a spectrum analyzer. Okay, that's nice. They they have another model that doesn't have the VNA features. Anybody have any comments or suggestions or, or think there might be some other models that we might want to look at uh, as alternatives to any of these? I have some contacts locally in San Diego for um, surplus and, and test equipment. So I, I will also uh, commit to making sure that we get the lowest possible price for the highest uh, quality gear. So that's one of the goals is to be extremely frugal with the fundraising that we have and make the most out of the opportunity that we've been given. Yeah, there's lots, you know, the, the Agilent, HP, Rodian, Schwartz, they, they all make equipment. Generally, the, the issue is, is your remote interfaces and your latest feature sets and for, particularly your VNA. I mean, having having these kind of VNA functions up to six gigahertz on a a platform that's under fifty thousand is almost unheard of. <laughs> uh, but you never know what you can come across. Uh, um, yeah, all of this is is selected with a design with a uh, with the requirement that it be remotely accessible, so that so that we can have um, international team actually get some some work done. So the sort of the rise of remote interfaces that are that make sense and, and are, are successful that people actually use in a work environment that that has been something that that we that has developed over time and that we're able to take advantage of here. So we have a very strong commitment to making this work and work well for people all over the world that want to contribute to uh, open source development. I'm curious. Um not right now, but down the road, do you think you'll ever get things like small thermal chambers? Because that would be quite useful for the broader community of being able to basically test a board over minus 40 to 100 degrees. Yeah, I've used thermal chambers at work before, and they're, they actually are uh, small enough and compact enough and, and relatively inexpensive to build. The, it gets it gets progressively much more expensive when you try to to get more towards the uh, the temperature extremes. But um, the ones that I've worked with in the past have been for industrial uh, temperature ranges. Uh, so yes, I think that that we could definitely look at that as soon as we start needing it. There are a mm -hmm. few yeah. temperature chambers that are accessible here locally, um, but if we had to to get one. Um, set up for, for, for our community, then yes, that's a, that's a possibility. The other thing that kind of goes along with temperature is vacuum and Applied Ion Systems has a vacuum chamber that they're using for, for their development for the ion motor. So we, we do have a, you know, a related project that we talk to uh, quite a bit and, and we could rely on their advice uh, and, and experience with uh, vacuum. That's further down the line. If, if we ever need to, to have our own, own vacuum chamber, then you know, that's also something that we should definitely keep in mind. And I'm sure that, that uh, over time with the, with the collaboration with existing groups, restoring communication, that we will um, we'll develop a network of equipment and resources that will allow us to do all the things that we need to do in order to uh, launch missions. Yeah, yeah, I think because there'll be lots of people that will benefit from, yeah, the different different um, capabilities. So yeah, over the next couple of years, if different groups are able to share stuff, that would be really useful. Yeah, I think there's, as we get to our actual boards, you know, six months or so down the road, 
having, uh, we can probably rig some ad hoc uh, vacuum thermal capabilities to, to the, the thing about space is you don't have any air cooling. So you, you basically got to create a vacuum if you want to evaluate any of your cooling solutions. So getting heat out of the unit because we'll, we'll generate, you know, 10 watts or so of power that we've got to dissipate and we'll have to engineer a solution to conduct that so that it can can reach the radiators. Some of that is more specific to the particular spacecraft, uh, but we'll want to have some solution that shows, demonstrate getting heat from the FPGAs and the, the, the radio chips, the main primary sources, getting that at least to the side of the, of the CubeSat package. Wally, there's a question about um, vibration testing, and do we know anything about any of the choices that we've made so far about uh, any of the, especially the, the connectors? Um, yes, the, we're, we're looking at the, the USB-C that we talked about as our primary interconnects. Um, so yes, we'll have to do vibration testing with that, and we will probably do that testing even before we have the, the boards laid out, the, the, the FPGA boards. In, in the plan, we'll be building a, a stack of USB-C uh, connectorings and their interconnects and the test capability so that we can test those and evaluate those for in a vibration environment. And we'll probably wanna do that first level of vibration testing to assure that we can comply with the uh, uh, standard uh, vibration requirements, even before we do the layout, because we want to have we want to have a co connector solution that we know works. Um, so there's a paper we we did do a paper on the, on the rough outlines of the USB-C, and uh, we'll we'll be taking that work to the next step. In fact, that's something that's going to be done over the next couple of uh, weeks, actually. So if uh, you know if anything comes up, if somebody thinks of something, just you know. Uh, pop pop something in the um, in the Slack or an email, and uh, we can add it to us. We try to try to put this uh, uh, get the final list together so we can start getting uh, getting this into place. Okay, thank you, Michelle and Wally. Um, yeah, thanks for the presentation. There's not not much I can add at the moment. I I looked at the list. I know some of the equipment. <laughs> but the problem is, uh, I think at the end, it's all very similar. It's only a matter of price uh, and indeed what you want to do with it. But uh, yeah, so not much to add from my side at the moment. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Peter. We really appreciate your, uh, your input. Um, I'll be talking with you uh, consistently uh, about, <laughs> about making, making sure that this is as useful as possible to all of your engineers and listening carefully to your feedback about uh, accessibility and, and ease of use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I, I actually, I, I sent your your Zoom invitation out to the team, I think it was yesterday or the day before, I, I don't know, remember. But unfortunately, uh, I think no one of them was able to attend today, but hopefully in future. Okay, okay. so thank you very much. I have to step out also and see you next time. You bet. Thank you. Bye.